joining us in the studio to take a look at supplementary elections is a researcher with the Center for Democracy and Development at Fulabi Adekayoja. And also with us, uh, who will be joining us later as a Rise News analyst, uh, Emmanuel Bello. Uh, thank you so much, Ademola, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, talk to us about what the CDD is um, getting from its own election analysis center. And then, of course, you would have heard our correspondent yeah. giving us an update just from one of the elections. There's that in KB, and then, of course, in other states uh, country, yeah. uh, across the country. So there are 24 states that are going to the polls in different elections, whether it's State House of Assembly, Senate, and House of Reps, and then, of course, the two governorships in Adamawa and KB. Uh, and, what, and what we did was we deployed observers primarily to Adamawa, KB, and Sokoto because the governorships and Sokoto has the largest number of, uh, of federal constituency elections that are taking place. So the three senators and then you know the ones in the House of Reps. Uh, and there are two major things that we've been able to really determine from our observers in the field. So the first one really was that there were still some logistical challenges that were experienced despite the you know the, the fact that there was some improvement but then there was still some actually re recorded. So in many local governments across the three states that I mentioned, you know, we had IDEC officials arriving as late as 10, 11 a.m. and then which even started at in noon in some particular places. So one of the challenges there is the case of where, you know, either because the information was not particularly clearly communicated or the fact that INEC officials just didn't turn up on time and then you had voters and observers who were there as early as 7.30 when, you know, you would expect INEC officials to be there to get ready for voting to start at 8.30. So one of the biggest challenges, especially going into the, you know, as, as we wrap up the entire election recap is the fact that, you know, how do we work to a situation where the logistical issues that INEC suffered throughout the entire electoral cycle can actually be improved upon for future elections? The second thing which is regrettable is that we actually recorded a very, very high rise in, in, in voter trading during the election cycle across the three states I mentioned. So whether you're looking at agents who are you know, flagrantly and blatantly coming out to, you know, to announce that they were willing to, to pay people for yeah, popular votes. to induce voters. Exactly. <laughs> as high as 25,000 naira, you know, and even in some particular area. Oh, for a voter, 25,000 naira. Wow. In <laughs> some areas in Kirby, actually, what we even saw that some some parties even added fertilizer or like clothes, mm -hmm. trying to really induce voters and trying to really one up the other yeah, parties. Yeah, I mean, there were those there. reports actually read. I mean, that they were using fertilizer, and I was like, I mean, it's so the farmers and it was that were being targeted. It, it, exactly. So it's a really big challenge when you're looking at the fact that you know, at the same time, you're trying to minimize the fact that you know, money is playing a very big role. You know, the social political dimension of the election, you know, is really going to be something that we that we study and look forward to really, you know, report releasing a report on. But then. That's something that has really skyrocketed. And I think the biggest challenge that we're, we're really worried about right now, especially for Nigeria's electoral process, is the fact that during this particular election cycle, there was, and during, this, during the elections today, there was no fear, you know, there were no, you know, there were no concerns about the presence of, you know, law officials, you know, and other, you know, uninformed officials who were pulled should have been present. So the concern really is about how do we work towards ensuring that we can remove the undue influence of money in our elections. All right, I'll just ask you to hold on. Let's go on this short break. And when we come back, we'll be talking about whether we had issues of uh, violence or, or any of that. Um, uh, so we'll just go on this short break. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. Stay with us. Welcome back from the break. You're still watching this week, and we're reviewing the supplementary elections ongoing or about to uh, be concluded in uh, 24 states of the Federation. Of course, we have uh, the major game ongoing in Adamawa State and uh, Kebi State. Uh, where we're having two governorship seats up for grab and then of course uh, Sokoto is also a major place where we have uh, three uh, senatorial seats that are up for grab and then uh, uh, we also have updates from different parts of the country uh, I still have Ademola uh, Adekaejo here who is um, has been talking to me uh, about all the issues it's from the Center for Democracy and Development. And uh, let's go, Ademola, uh, into the issues of violence. Now, I'm just reading uh, that uh, Rice News gathered that a yet to be identified man was reportedly shot dead uh, while he was attempting to snatch a ballot box uh, in uh, Kirby State. Uh, they said from polling unit 001 in Fakai local government area of the state. Have you been receiving uh, reports like this? And I'm also wondering why should people still be snatching ballot boxes? So, we've actually, so 
we've, we've actually received very similar you know, issues of, of voter suppression, especially during the elections in Kebi and Sagutu in particular. So there was even an instance you know, in Rufada, Amiru, and polling units in, in Kebi where, where hoodlums actually descended on the, on, the, uh, on the polling units and then the voting had to be halted until you know, things had been resolved and then until law enforcement came and they were now able to try to dissuade and to, you know, and to resolve this, the situation. So ultimately, one of the biggest concerns, like you already rightly mentioned, is the fact that people still feel that there is a need to you know, try to suppress or try to affect the voting process, especially by trying to snatch ballot boxes. Now, one of the biggest concerns and one of the questions that we really need to be asking is, you know, not just in terms of logistics, because you're also looking at the dimension of security and how safe people can feel going out to vote. So this was a concern that we actually had been able to pick up on during the governorship election, where many citizens did feel that because of what happened during presidential elections, that they felt less encouraged and less enthused to come out and vote. So now we're not looking at a similar case where, you know, what does this mean for people being able to feel confident and comfortable to come out and vote? And what are security agencies and officials doing to ensure that, you know, many of these particular areas are well secured, are well protected, and then that their personnel are actually well distributed to ensure that people feel safe going out to vote? So that's one thing that we actually are picking up on and even, even even in areas where you have agents and party people also trying to rile up the crowd and then having any of these particular fights or clashes between their different groups uh, and the biggest concern really is now you know what that means in terms of not engendering a much more partisan you know divide between citizens ideally what you want is a case where citizens come out they vote somebody gets elected and then that person is responsible for now dealing with the situation going forward but then what you're now worried about is a case where you know if you have these deepening divides, then even after the election, we're not, what now happens with the resolution process? What happens when somebody is now in position to now say, okay, fine, how can I work with the person, other people who have you know, contested and lost going forward? And that's something that we're actively trying to, you know, to work on and to see how, how things can be studied, especially for future elections. Yeah, and then uh, we actually hear that some senatorial results are already uh, been announced yes. with candidates actually announced. Uh, there's this one from Plateau Central yeah. Senatorial Zone where we have um, INEC declaring uh, the APC candidate winner. Now, some of these uh, uh, um, senatorial and House of Reps seats were up for grabs. Some of them, the margin was very low and uh, people were wondering why INEC had to go into uh, declaring some of them inconclusive and all of that. I know the focus was on the governorship elections, yes. but the CTD actually, you know, studied some of those House of Reps uh, uh, and then uh, uh, senatorial, including state assembly elections as to why some of those, uh, you know, seats were declared inconclusive. Well, ultimately, one of the one of the trends I was seeing is that th there were very few states where you had a complete clean sweep for particular parties. So I think at the last time that we checked, only 11 states uh, actually were in a, a situation where from the presidential vote to governorship, senator out of reps, where you know, a single party was able to clear all the votes in the particular areas. And now what that means is that we have, you know, I mean, we, we could hope for a much more mature electorate where you're able to you know, distinguish between people on different parties. But then what you're finding is that there's much more competition between, you know, between these particular parties in the, in, in, in the election cycle. Now, Another reason why it's really important is because of how influential any of these seats actually play a role in the composition of the National Assembly. Yeah, I right. mean, it's been very controversial, as exactly. I've read, you know, the contest for the Senate presidency and speaker. Exactly. And, you, and, and what is also going to be very important is the fact that, you know, on, on different dimensions, the first is the case where, you know, in a place like the Senate, the APC has already secured a majority. So we know that the Senate president is you know, definitely going to be Senate, you know, a member of the, of the APC. But the House is a much more, you know, fine margin where, you know, the APC needs to get almost all the remaining 33 seats that are yet to be mm -hmm. determined to actually get a clear majority. So right now you have the opposition parties where, you know, they're able to even make more inroads in this election collectively will outnumber the APC. Now, these very small, you know, issues might, you know, they might seem very, you know, small in isolation, but then collectively they will play a very big role in how effective and how you and how free the next government is going to be able to govern, especially when you're looking at interactions between the executive and the legislative arm of government. So that's why it's really important to also look at those particular elections. And even how, for example, parties might say that if a particular zone was much more, you know, susceptible to their message and they were able to get more supporters, that then surely they should reward that particular zone. So these things are playing a very big role in the way that parties are actively trying to ensure that they can win uh, elections in these particular constituencies and then how that will play a bigger role in the way the country looks in the next four years. And then just uh, just one very small point, especially looking at the, at the recent amendments that have been passed, we're going to see 
potentially much more you know, active and much more independent state houses of assembly, which now brings in a different dynamic in terms of how these elections might not play a very big role in terms of how yeah, we can work in with the future. Governors. I mean, but, but let's talk about the state assembly elections too. I mean, not so many people are focusing on them. Yeah. They just seem to be, you know, reclusive and all of that. And people are wondering if indeed uh, we don't need to start paying more attention into how, uh, uh, you know, some of these state assembly men are elected. So I think one of the biggest mistakes that we can actually make is, is, is assuming that any position that's elected, you know, and that people are actively going to put resources and time and energy to really get is unimportant because ultimately all of these different electoral officials from you know local government chairs all the way to the president play a very big role in, in, in impacting and affecting the way that we live our lives as Nigerians. So one important thing that we're also tracking is that, like I mentioned earlier, the impact of what these amendments are going to mean going forward. You know, will we have much more activist state houses of assemblies that can stand up to governors and really try to change that perception of them being robust stamp houses for, for executive arms of governments? Will we find much more people who are now using state houses of assembly to even pivot and grow into much more you know, relevant positions or even much more national and uh, into the national limelight so we're looking at how this this play a very big role but then one thing that's also important is that in most cases you rarely find uh, state, state structures where the state house of assembly is in a different party than the governor. Now, we're looking at positions where, you know, either by dint or by, you know, by the individual strength of a particular person, you have these particular potentials really coming about. And then how that dynamic will play going forward for the next four years. So it's really something that we are really encouraging Nigerians to look at. And even before the election, we've been really adamant that even though there was a lot of focus on the presidency, that there was actually a lot to be focused on the other yeah. elections down ballot. Okay. Let's talk about um, the woman who's, uh, you know, struggling very hard to become the first elected female governor, uh, Senator Aisha Tobinani, uh, squaring up with an incumbent, uh, Amadou Fintiri, who is seeking re-election. Uh, what's, what's been the sort of information that the CDD has been gathering from the election in Adam State? Because that's where, you know, yeah. uh, we have a lot of controversy. If you look at that of Kebi, I mean, the difference is already about 45,000 between the APC and PDP candidate. But in... Uh, 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 Adamawa, the difference was 30,000 between the PDP and the APC candidates. So what's been uh, the information you're getting? So, so quite interestingly, actually, if, if I'm not mistaken, the margin in the Kebi is actually way less between the PDP and the APC. So it actually looks like a much more you know, competitive race. But then definitely Adamawa is something that everybody was looking at, especially because mm -hmm. you know, the prospect of the first elected female governor you know, in, Nigerian, uh, in Nigerian history. So what we're also looking at now is, is really in trying to translate the analysis that can be gotten from the previous results. So the margin between the governor and the senator, you know, was quite large. And then if you look at the registered voters and then those who had even gotten their PVCs in the affected PUs and LGAs, it would need to, it would almost need to be a hundred percent, you know, vote to, you know, to really flip the margin. So that's something that is really quite tight and that we're looking at. But like we've already been picking up on, and I think like a correspondent already mentioned, there's been a very high turnout. So we don't know how high that will play a role, but then that's something that's really quite telling. Um, but one thing that we are also looking at, especially, you know, going forward is that Ultimately, there's actually been quite, you know, a step back in terms of representation for women in the Nigerian political space. So you have less senators, you know, there's a marginal increase in House of Reps candidates, and sorry, um, House of Reps candidates who have actually won. Uh, but then ultimately, there's still this sense that, you know, that there's a step back in terms of how much progress had been recorded, and something that we're actively trying to see how things can change, and how even just how, you know, what are the challenges that women candidates are facing. Uh, on some level, you know, and we can be honest about it, you know, that we're looking at some particular messaging about religion, so I'm just messaging about part of the country where the, where the election is taking place in. Uh, and then while we don't think that these are things that are universally accepted, I mean, she got the candidate nomination for the ruling part in the country. Yeah, it's still I mean, the which, which is a very strong one, actually, exactly. for her to have got that. Exactly. So people say it's a win, uh, you in know, itself. on its own. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Uh, but, then, but then ultimately, you know, like, there's always, like, there are wins and then there are, you know, there are bigger wins. And they are trying to make sure that at the, at the end of the day, the re it's the representation and what it means for you know other do people. You, do you think that around. the religious factors may count on, on uh, during the supplementary polls as people go out? Maybe it may affect her chances, or uh, what do you think will be in the mind of voters, voters especially within uh, Adamawa State? As so it, while we were coming. Social media, especially while trying to get an idea of the of the landscape for disinformation and misinformation, we have actually seen in instances where you have people who are actively going out and tweeting or making posts about how you know 
voting for a for a woman for governor is against the teaching of the prophets. Uh, and then while we don't think that that's something that you know people should really take into account, we have to understand that we live in very different echo chambers, right? So you are looking at the space where if somebody is able to really put that message in across, and then the people who the influence are able to pick that up and then not really get exposed to different ideas, they might go out around and actually take that as they're going to vote. But ultimately, and this is one thing that we're really quite you know certain about these ceilings are actually getting broken slowly but surely because you know it's not too long ago where we had you know um the senator Aisha Hassan you know, of blessed memory in Taraba yes, who actually um, who had had wanted to become the governor of Taraba state exactly and, all that. And, and not too far off you know especially yes, from Adamawa now yes. and yes. then we will see a case definitely where you know we, we, we will have more candidates who, who are women who are also able to to really transcend this particular discussion not just because they are women but because they're actually strong yeah and then coincidentally it was still in the same apc that exactly. we had uh, you exactly. know uh, the late senator actually contesting where she got that ticket in 2015 15. and the apc also gave uh, someone else in adamawa so it looks like within that region uh, they seem to be There's gender friendly and exactly, <laughs> especially yeah. in the governing party but we must thank you so much uh, ademola uh adekayoja who is a researcher with the center for democracy and development and of course uh, you've helped us understand some of the issues that are ongoing in nigeria supplementary posts which are holding in 24 states of the uh, federation with special emphasis on two states where the governorship seats are up for grabs that's adamawa state and uh, kebi state Thank you.